before we do our end of semester exams. So we had already done abdominal examination, mal presentation, mal positions, uh, cord prolapse, uterine inversion, postpartum hemorrhage management, using the condom tamponade, abdominal aorta compression, and also bimanual compression. The manual removal of the of a retained placenta together with examination of the placenta. So this morning, then when we are done, uh, we'll take uh, just about three topics. When we are done with it, we we'll move on to uh, pathographs. Pathograph as another topic that we, we just want to, we all know, but we just want to briefly consider a few things and then from the normal to the abnormal plotting of the pathograph. And so this is what we are going to do today. Even though the time is far spent, we'll be able to go through what we have mentioned. So briefly, abdominal examination. This one is to the whole class because we already know we have been doing it uh, along, along our practical uh, experiences. And so briefly from the class, somebody should come up with abdominal examination. What is the importance of even doing abdominal examination? What are we trying to find out? What are we trying to look out for? And so on and so forth. So from the group. Hello, I'm Christian. Hello. Hello, good morning, everybody. Yes, on abdominal exam, I'm Pasha Roxon. On abdominal examination. Okay. We want to look at the fetal well-being by assessing the auscultation. Okay. Uh, but then we need to look at the four steps in assessing the fetal well-being and the maturity. First is the inspection, okay. palpation, and auscultation. Okay. And so with the palpation, as we do the fundal palpation, we are looking at the, the lie, presentation, maturity, and the symphysofundal measurement. Okay. Then the lateral palpation, we are looking at the position in relation to maternal pelvis, either anterior or posterior. Okay. Then the pelvic palpation, we we'll look at the presentation, whether it's podalic or cephalic. Then the descent of the fetal ahead, if it has crossed the station or not. Then was quotation looking at the fetal well-being, whether the fetal heart rate is deceleration or assimilation. Then generally, we we'll look at the general health of the mother from head to toe. If there is any existing medical condition like anemia, uh, vital signs are also taken to check whether there is hypertension or preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, and give the mother education on findings. And we encourage this woman to come for periodic medical checkup so that we're able to carry the pregnancy to 10. Thank you. Thank you, too. Any addition? Any addition to what sister has mentioned? Restricting ourselves to the abdomen, abdominal examination. Hello. Let's move on. We all know we have a gist to, she's mentioned a mild presentation and then mild position during abdominal ex examination where we can detect all these things. Why do you think it's important even to uh, look at uh, all these things? 
as midwives. You know, we carry it out antenatally. We carry it out during uh, labor. And then abdominal examination post packing to we also carry it out. So why do you think it's important for the midwife to carry out all these things, especially with a, let's say, with an inspection? inspection or observation on the abdomen. Hello. 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 Please, do inspection because I don't know of the, uh, the course of the scar. We also do the inspection alone. Sometimes where the abdomen can tell you the presentation. Sometimes if it is transverse, looking at the abdomen alone, you can know, detect something. And what again? Hello, sister. Yeah. With the inspection, um, during inspection, we said we look out for any um abdominal scars, any um stri gravidarium, and then the linear nigra. That those will also tell you that she's had a previous pregnancy before. To so give you a brief idea about her past obstetrical history, okay. and then also you look at how the skin is whether there's any rashes over there, any skin lesion or anything too, that is not healthy, then you advise accordingly. Advice accordingly, okay. Then on inspection, can we also uh, look out for the fetal movement? Fetal movement. Can we easily see it when we are observing the abdomen? Yes. Yes, sister. Okay. So there will be movement up and downs of the, the rising and fall of the abdomen. When the woman is stable, she's lying down, you can see that the fetus is active, moving, uh, raising maybe either the limbs up and down. We can easily find out or see some of these things. Okay. It's very, very important for us to note all these items that we are mentioning. And so with the malposition, malposition, uh, yeah. yes. Sorry to intrude at this time. This I want to know, with the fetal movement, mm -hmm. can you say you can assess the fetal movement depending on the gestational age? Depending on a gestational age, because uh, with preterms, you know, they are very, very uh, vulnerable and they are almost always silent. So depending on that, that's why I always say we use our judgment, we use our discretion in some of these things. So you are correct. You are correct. Depending on the gestational age of the pregnancy. Okay. Thank you for that uh, addition coming back Just to my, hello please with the inspection too at times um you do the palpation you mm -hmm. you try to like because of the gestational age you can't listen to the auscultation like the fetal heart but then with the movements then you realize that the, the fetus is alive okay. or viable uh -huh. you can also yes. yeah. I also talk about depending on the gestational age, if she's up, uh, in the third trimester, we have to listen to the fetal heart rate uh, for one minute. In fact, but the, at the ANC, the true story is that if someone sees the fetus moving or she places the fetoscope and then she's able to listen to the fetal heart rate, uh, she will quickly just take 
plus there because she has felt the fetal heart rate. I once witnessed a case at a facility in Accra where somebody came and then uh, the, the midwife did the examination all right. When she went to the uh, fetal heart rate, she just placed the fetoscope there, then she wrote, then I told her, oh, let me uh, also listen to the heart rate. But I, I took a little time. And so I realized the fetal heart rate was, not, was irregular. So I counted. By the count of uh, one minute, I had less than 100. So I told her, and in fact, she was almost, she was 38 plus. And so I said, like, if she had a Doppler, we can use a Doppler also to identify the fit. So she brought it up and then we did it. And that one also gave that. And so we said, okay, let's refer and see the doctor so that she can do a scan and to confirm what we are hearing. And so even when the doctor did a scan, the fetal heart rate has even reduced to, uh, uh, I think it was around 80 something. And so she was placed on the left side for another 15 to 30 minutes. And it was done again. It was still very low. And rather it was reducing with the strength. And so the doctor concluded fetal heart rate. In fact, from the ANC, she was sent to the theater. And so I always feel that even at the ANC, it should take a little time to check the fetal heart rate. Uh, at least a minute will not take the whole time. Unless we say that we have a lot of clients with us, we cannot spend uh, one minute over. But it is for their sake that why we are there. So if we take a time, we'll be able to uh, know. Otherwise, you go home, and then the next one week she will come. The fetal heart rate may not be uh, identified. Uh -huh. So it's very, very important when we are, because that's why we are saying fetal well-being. If we want the well-being of the fetus, then we should spend a little time to uh, identify it, count it a little, and then write. Uh, the figure around there, especially at the third trimester, you can easily count and then write it there. Okay, thank you. Then we move on to the mouth positions. With the mouth positions and the mouth presentation, I think it almost go together. So with the mouth presentation, we say, if someone comes, you examine, and then you identify a transverse lie will say it's a mal presentation, right? And then if a bridge can also be a mal presentation, okay? Even though it may be longitudinal lie, it is small because it is not the hair that is presenting. So it's a botox that is presenting for us. But now with the mouth position, we normally specifically talk about the uh, occipital posterior position. Aside of that, do we have any more position that we can discuss around? Occipital posterior position actually very, very common with us than other positions that we can talk of. Let's discuss around the occipital posterior positions and the other mouth positions that we can think of.
Please. The house. Mal presentation, mal position said. A few management that can use to address the situations. Mal position, mal presentation. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh -huh. My position, my presentation. Any addition, any subtraction. Another position that we can talk of. Oh, my dear police. Hello, sister. Hello. I'm thinking of a brow or face presentation. Uh -huh. Okay. So if we say face presentation, what are we trying to, on abdominal examination, what actually would we feel? So when you are palpating the, uh, 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 a woman with face uh, presentation, for you to be able to identify that this is what is really happening. You see that uh, on palpation, uh, you realize a groove. A groove may be felt between the occiput and the, the back. So that when you put your hand, especially to the uh, pelvic palpation, you want to identify what is occupying there. Instead of uh, uh, assessing the, the head, which is uh, anterior, uh, posterior presentation, left occipital or right occipital, anterior of, uh, positions, you may realize that because it is the face, the head is deflex. Are you getting my point? The head is deflex. And so it leaves a groove between the head and then the, 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 the occipital area, then the back of, when you are feeling for the back, you move downwards, we feel something like a groove over there. Uh -huh. So even on abdominal examination, it's easy to feel that. And then when you come back and do vaginal examination, in labor, you, you see that your, your fingers may even enter into the mouth. And then you can feel the, Bony, the, uh, the jaw bones so easy during a uh, vaginal examination. So, in fact, it takes experience to identify some of these things. And so, with the face uh, presentation, your hand into the vagina may enter into the mouth. Stop, please, we can't hear. I'm saying that with the face presentation, you can easily. Uh, Sister, please, what happens is if your head goes to the other side, we can't hear you. And it goes to the left side. Yes, please. Oh, yes, now can you hear? Yes, yes. Sister. Yes. Oh. All right. And so you can easily uh, examine or palpate. And then you feel a groove between the occipital region or the occiput and then the back. The head is deflex, upwards like this. And so during abdominal examination, you may feel uh, that one day. Uh -huh. And now with the simple uh, sensible, oh yeah, or the brow presentation, 
the head is like a military attitude. It's not too deflex and it's not too flex. So it's in between. It's straight like this. And so you feel the same support when you are doing vagina examination. And so that is where your, your fingers may enter into the eye of the baby. So these are all uh, mild presentations, mild positions at the same time. And so when we are doing abdominal examination, it is not only to identify the normal presentation of the baby, but also the abnormal presentation of the baby. All right. And with the occipital posterior position, what happens? Can we talk a little about that occipital, occipital posterior position? Hello. Hi. Uh huh. OPP. OPP. Hello, sister. Yes, please. Um, with the OPP on palpation, you'd feel as uh, you'd in the, with the inspection, a saucer shaped depression will be seen on the abdomen. Saucer shaped depression. Why? Why would that be? It's a mal position, and it is so. Put... <coughs> Sorry. Sorry. What, what will let us identify that this is the OCPO that is presenting? You know, when, when you are paid like a social shape, so the, the lower abdomen will become flat on for a patient instead of uh, finding uh, a head in a board like situation, you see that the, 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 the abdomen is flattened. And the limbs will be palpable anterior because the baby is lying backwards. And then you can palpate, you can easily palpate the limbs at the anterior parts. And so these are all uh, mal positions, mal presentations, which when we palpate, may be able to identify. But all the lies are longitudinal. With breach, the lies longitudinal and the mal uh, occipital posterior positions and all the brow, the face, they are all having the lie uh, presentations. Okay. And so let's move on to court. Are we, are we okay with that? Otherwise, let's move on to the court presentation and the management. What are some of the causes? What may cause a cord to present? Polyhydraminos. Okay. Mm -hmm. Multiple gestation. Multiple gestation. Abnormal presentation. Hello, I'm not getting it. Abnormal presentation. Example. Early rapture of memory. Rich. Early rapture. No, I, I wanted a clarification on abnormal presentation. The abnormal presentation. I wanted a, a, an example of an abnormal presentation. Sister, which presentation? With bridge, yes. She can collapse the cord very easily. And mm -hmm. Okay, and, and then the, the next point was what? Early rapture of memories or? Unstable the, line. Sister, you are saying uh, presentation, you are, you are not saying called prolapse. So I don't think early rapture of memories can be a point. Okay, okay. Called presentation, okay. Uh -huh. From the male voice, what did you mention? I didn't get it, please. 
I was saying if uh, there is also unstable line, I think unstable uh, line, unstable line. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that can also cause the cord to collapse. All right. And how do we uh, manage cord collapse? Hello. Cord prolapse. Briefly, please. Hello, hello, sister. Hello. Please, with the cord prolapse, uh, its management, we are looking at uh, monitoring the fetal well being to prevent asphyxia as well as the mother. Okay. Please, you. Encourage a woman to avoid uh, moving around. Then, if it is so, boost up from everything. The network is not helping. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Uh, I want to also try, please. <laughs> try. Yeah, with the court uh, management of uh, court presentation, as my I sister think, actually. Please, please, it's court prolapse we are talking about. Oh, I meant presentation, eh? Yes. Oh, that's so very sorry. Okay. We are dealing with court prolapse. Okay. Uh huh. Then I think with the court prolapse, uh, if the Woman is sec is in second stage of labor. Then I think you have to expedit uh, labor by giving a, a general epistectomy, okay. and then to hit delivery in order to prevent uh, any spasms of the cord leading to fetal asphyxia or a uh, stillbirth. Mm -hmm. Then, if the woman is also in the first stage of labor, then mm -hmm. you have to prepare the woman for emergency CS. Okay. Done. Okay. And uh, the bladder too will also have to be inflated to release pressure off the presenting part. Okay. That will be red. Yes. Uh -huh. And that's, well, that's on the uterus. Okay. And I also think uh, uh, the woman should be nursed in knee chest position. Mm -hmm. So with the knee chest position, that will prevent or relieve pressure of the contractions that Maybe four. So once the woman is in knee chest position, then mm -hmm. the pressure is being reduced. So there will be no more dilatation taking place, or dilatation will rather be smooth. So, uh, I think uh, the preparation done to uh, exercise the delivery, as I mentioned first. Then, oh. uh, uh, the, if the court had already prolapsed, then I think we have to. In order to prevent uh, spasms of the cord, then we have to uh, cover up the cord with uh, normal uh, uh, gauze soaked in warm normal saline. Mm -hmm. so that will prevent uh, the cord from becoming uh, uh, dried up, dried leading, dried to, up. leading to uh, spasms and then leading to fissile. Uh, 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 as physios and then still best before as you are now journeying to the next level of care. Okay. Then administration of oxytocin to like I think who who no administration of oxygen oxygen right yeah. when you get to the next level definitely mm -hmm. the woman will be in distress. So I think administering oxygen to also keep the woman alive. It's also very important. Mm -hmm. And then as well as uh, monitoring the vital signs as well, both the fetal heart rate and then the maternal uh, condition, and then signing the consent form 
to now go into the theater. Then oh. it's just called prolapse. You should be very aware that you deliver an asphyxiated baby yeah. to for uh, uh, resuscitation uh, tree mm -hmm. so that you resuscitate the baby. Okay. I think uh, uh, what I can uh, remember or I can also add up. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sister, please, I wanted to correct something, if I'm okay. correct. All right. I, I heard him saying with the cord prolapse, the woman may be in distress. I don't think the woman may be in distress with the cord prolapse. It can be the fetus. Mm -hmm. Okay, the fetus so the... the the fetus might be in distress so that they can provide the oxygen. But I don't uh -huh. think it be the woman. Okay, thank you. So that if the woman is giving the oxygen, it will still be transferred to the uh, fetus. Yes, yes so that, Okay, thank you but for that. I also, I also think, yes, it's, it's accepted. But I also think, depending on your location, for instance, where I found myself mm -hmm. is a typical village. It's a very bad network where even motorbikes find it difficult to fly on the road, talk less of a tricycle, which we use as our means of transport in okay. terms of referral. But mm -hmm. I think with this uh, with bad road networks, then you shake this man get to the, uh, the nearby facility. I think you, 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 the woman will be in a little bit. I think I can remember last semester before we start our abnormal uh, liver mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, exam, a day to the abnormal liver exam, I had a very terrible PPH case. And mm -hmm. that's, it was just timely that the woman didn't die. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. So, court rulers, we are all conversant with it. And we try to do our best to save the baby when uh, the cord is pulsating during our vaginal examination. If she's in second stage, we expect her delivery. If she's in the first stage, we do well to uh, position the woman, inflate the bladder, and the off on a knee position. Then we soak. Uh, warm saline cover the cord to prevent spasms and then dryness. Then we help to transport this woman to the nearby facility if the cord is uh, pulsating. All right. And so, do we have any question or any addition? Otherwise, we move to our next. Uh, Area. All right. So, Hello, sister. Yeah. Please, I want to add up, like in first stage, mm -hmm. when we are doing our clients and membranes ruptured we should do well not to let them be walking around too much because that will collapse the cord okay yes very very true and so when membranes rupture the women should be stabilized in bed because the moment she continues to move around and some of them during that period you, re you realize that any contrastions they will be buried down and that can cause the cord also to Thank you for the addition. All right. And so we move on to the photograph as we, uh, as I mentioned earlier. So on the photograph, we all know that we have fetal condition, maternal condition, and the progress of labor. So let's outline that. And from there, we move on to the plotting. So what are some of the parameters in the fetal condition? Fetal condition on the pathograph. 
Pizza Hut wait. Ah, Pizza Hut wait. Okay. Like up the color. Then molding, degree of molding. Okay. Okay. So I will tell you how the fetus is doing. Pizza Hut wait, molding, and then like or amning. Membranes, whether they are ruptured, and you note the color. Good. Let's move on to the progress of labor. Descent. Descent. Dilatation. Dilatation of what? Of the service. Okay. Contraction. Contractions. Okay. And so this will tell us whether the labor is progressing or is not progressing. Sister, please, head descent. Okay, somebody mentioned already, but it says mm -hmm. the head descent, cervical dilatation, and then mutual contractions. All right. Then let's talk about maternal condition. BP, blood pressure of the mother. Okay. Pulse. The pulse of the mother. Mm -hmm. Temperature of the mother. Mm -hmm. The urine. 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 Okay. And so that is maternal condition. Medication. Come again. Medication. Is it drugs? Medication. Oh, okay. Medication, well, if the woman is put on any, so medication column also over there for the mother. All right, thank you. Now, we have the alert line and then the action line. So plotting of the parameters of the progress of labor, should always move to the left of the alert line. And so if it uh, moves to the right, it moves to action, it means that there is a problem. With the three that we have mentioned, either with the contractions or with the cervical dilatation or the head descent of the fetus, either of them, if there is a failure of its coordination, there may be a problem and the uh, labor may uh, linger until a correction is actually carried out. Okay. So for example, if the woman came, she's four centimeters, she's in the active phase. And it is known that uh, Labor or cervical dilatation should dilate at least one centimeter every hour. And so if she came, she's four centimeters. By the hour of four, that is four hours later, all things being equal, she should be moved to eight centimeters. And so you see that the plotting will follow the left of the alert line. And then we give the woman two hours. Within the two hours, she may progress to 10 centimeters of food dilatation of the cervix. And so the plotting will be normal. So this is a normal plotting, the photograph. In uh, the, the timings, the hours, and everything goes along. And I always say that when we are plotting the photograph, write the time first, plot, sorry, plot the cervical dilatation before you write the time. Otherwise, by the time you write the time, you may wrongly plot on the photograph. So that one, very, very, very important. Okay. Now let's look at this. If the plotting moves to the left, uh, move to the right of the uh, alert line, the action is there. So it's telling us to take an action. It's telling us to take an action. Okay. And it may be um, uh, abnormal plotting depending on 
For example, contractions, weak contractions. And so it may prolong the first stage of labor. Now, with, we all know that with uh, who modified pathograph, the woman is supposed to spend how many hours with us if she comes in active phase of four. Hello. Hello. Hi. 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 You are too quiet for my life. If she came and she's four centimeters in the next four hours, she would be eight. And the, uh, so that will bring us to the normal plotting. With the abnormal plotting, if the plotting of the cervical dilatation, the head descent, they all move to the right of the alert line. It prolongs the first stage of labor. Then I was asking if the problem identified is weak uterine contractions. If it is the, it is due to weak uterine contractions. If she came, she's four. The next four hours, instead of uh, eight, she may move to six. And so that it will be between the alert and the action line. So the plotting will be moving to the right of the alert line. That is where the action line, she may even cross the action line. And so with that one, we reassess our woman, find out the problem. If it has to do, with contractions, we correct it. And that is where the maternal condition, where we may set up an IV infusion, and then we add up uh, oxytocin to speed up the contractions. Then if it has to do with the descent, what happens? If the descent is static, if 4 cm, the descent is four over five. The next four hours, it repeats itself four over five. What happens over there? What may be the issue? Even though contractions are very good, and then cervical dilatation is also moving, but the descent is static. What will be the problem? Maybe first question. Good morning. Good morning. Morning. I do my work. Please, can you come again with your answer? My small position or CPD. 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 That tells you that our mouth position. Our mouth position. So that means if it is CPD, it is telling us that the baby is bigger than the pelvis. And so that one, there is nothing you can do apart from CS. Am I right? So we get. Okay, thank you. So we have come in to solve that problem of the passenger. The passenger is bigger than the passage. And so the passage has become too small for that baby. Now, if it has to do with the contraction, then we say that it is the powers. If you are moving a vehicle and there is no fuel in it, it cannot move. So the powers are weak. That is why we come in to set up uh, uh, oxytocin with normal saline, and then we titrate or we add up. If we start, for example, uh, 20 drops or 15 drops, every 30 minutes we have to add up five drops until a maximum contraction of about three contractions lasting between 30 and 40 is obtained and then we maintain that drops. We have 
added up to about 40 drops per minute, 40 drops. We maintain it from there onwards where the uterine contraction may become more than 40 seconds when you reach the shading point. Okay. Now, if it has to do with cervical dilatation, what do we do? If it has to do with cervical dilatation, that is the problem. Descent is moving, contraction is good. Service is not able to dilate in relation to the contractions and the head descent. What may be the problem? Hello. Hi. Hi. What, what may be the problem? Sister, it could be that the head is not well applied to the service, so there is no cervical dilatation. Okay. So the cervical dystocia. Cervical dystocia. And so if the head is not well applied. It may be loose on the head, and so it becomes difficult for the uh, service to dilate very, very well. Can it be that even with very good uterine contractions, the service cannot be well applied to the head? Yes, yeah, sister. Okay, so what would be our solution? If it is a cervical dystocia, there is not much that we can do. She may end up with CS because service is not uh, dilating as we want. It becomes very firm and sometimes even very hard to open up. And so with that one, there should be termination of labor by CS. Okay. And so with all these things, we are trying to draw something over here for our plotting on the pathograph. Occasionally, somebody's cervical dilatation may move from the left to the right. If it is corrected very well with, for example, we find a problem to be with uh, the uterine contractions and it's corrected with oxytocin, with normal saline, and it's monitored very well. It may, even though it was moving to the right, uh, right side, you see that once the contractions began, begin to improve and very well, you see that the cervical dilatation will move upwards between the left and the right. And she can fully, she can become fully dilated and deliver. It is also there. So it depends on uh, our monitoring. That is the problem. And I think that all over, it is a big issue, a problem. I learned Ghana Health Service has a new modified photograph, and I don't know whether it's still is being used because I know some areas, they still use the old photographs we do. I don't know about uh, the other one. Is it being used at your facilities? Hello, sister. Yeah. Yes, it is true that uh, pathograph has been replaced by WHO Labor Care Guide. Okay. It's not every facility that is using it, even in uh -huh. the schools. Uh huh. It's not every school that is using it. It was just introduced. I think last year during the COVID time. Okay. And okay. A, a workshop was done by WHO worldwide during the COVID. And mm -hmm. NMC also made a webinar on it. Mm -hmm. And so some schools, what they did was to introduce it to their final year students. Mm -hmm. And those who have done the 
uh, the family-centered maternity care study okay. so that they'll be able to have knowledge on it. Mm -hmm. Some schools have also been able to organize midwives within their districts and mm -hmm. they have been, the dissemination of information have been made on it. Mm -hmm. It is good. Uh, I don't know whether we have to, I can just give a brief introduction on what that new photograph is about. Okay, so you can do that. All right. Hello. Maybe from her network. It's like Sister Portia has muted herself. She has muted herself. Yes, oh, please. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, I said it has seven sections. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. It has seven sections. And the seven section, the first section is about the client particulars and the labor characteristics. Client particulars are the client name. And the labor characteristics is about the parity, onset of labor, mm -hmm. and active labor that whether membranes have ruptured their date and time and the hours. That is the first section. The actress in the client particulars is about a medical risk, whether she has any medical condition, existing with hypertension, anemia, and all those that we know. Mm -hmm. Then the obstetrical risk is about any problem that she had during previous labor or pregnancy or postpartum, PPH, antipartum hemorrhage, whether she had SCS and all that. Mm -hmm. And the second section is about supportive care. Supportive care is about companion at birth, pain relief. And here the pain relief, we are looking at non pharmacological pain relief mm -hmm. or pathological, but we are interested in non pharmacological. The mm -hmm. essence to help this woman have positive childbirth experience. Then the oral fluid, which is given to the client frequently, then posture of the client. She should be allowed to assume any posture of her choice unless there is rapture of memory. Mm -hmm. Then the third session is about the baby. Mm -hmm. We look at the baseline fetal heart rate, whether it's deceleration or acceleration, amniotic fluid, then the fetal position, whether posterior, transverse, or anterior. Then the caput. What then we look at the degree of caput too. Then the molding of the baby. So that is about the third section. The fourth section is about the woman. We we'll check her pulse, the diastolic and systolic, and the temperature and urine, as we have just discussed. Mm -hmm. Then the fifth section is about the contraction, labor progress. So here is the same as what you have on the pathograph. Contractions, okay. cervical dilatation, and this thing. Mm -hmm. But this one, the difference is that you don't shade any contraction. Okay. You only need to plot the number of contractions that the client has gained and the duration for the uterine contraction. Cervical dilatation starts at uh, 5 cm. Unlike our pathograph, that starts at 4 cm. Mm. This end will use the same symbol and it's the same as the pathograph that we have. Mm -hmm. Then the fifth section is about medication. We'll give oxytocin, any medication that you give, and IV fluid, you state it. Then the uh, seventh section is the shared decision making. Any client who comes with a problem, you, the midwife, we need to share with her. What can we do about it? So here, the midwifery process or the nursing process comes in where you assess the client. Then both of you arrive at what you want to do for the client. So on that part of, uh, sheet, on that labor care guide, you can see a column on assessment. So for instance, if I assess the client and she complains of pain, 
So this means she needs pain relieving measures. So on your plan, pain relief measure are quite a given. Is it a massage? Is it hydrotherapy? Is it just a touch? You add that. So that then your initials will be there. So that is the seven sections of the new labor care guide. It has replaced the pathograph. So we are still disseminating gradually for people to become aware. And this makes it easier because the protein, as we have just discussed, it, mm -hmm. it, it, it is difficult for some people to internalize how the plotting should be done. <laughs> so this has come to replace the pathograph. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. You are welcome. The period for uh, monitoring is the same as what we have. And this one too, it has second stage added to it. Unlike our previous pathograph. With this one, we don't consider the allocation, whether the service is one cm per hour. What they are saying that the consistency of the service differs in women. Just as we knew that uh, we knew if we that. are not pregnant or if we are pregnant, your service pressure is your nose. When you are in labor, it is your lips. It differs. So here, we allow the client to go through. So if we look at the chart, a client at 5 cm can be in the 5 cm for six hours. But you only need to consider the maternal condition and fetal condition. Mm -hmm. So that's a brief that I can add on the WHO Labor Care Guide. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Wow. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sample of it. Okay, I'm trying. Yes. Yes. Please, I learned yes, that the, I learned that active phase of labor starts at 5 cm. In yes, I said labor. it. I said it. Yeah, she mentioned it. Active phase start. Active labor starts at 5 cm. So if a client comes and she's not in 5 cm, do your work and plot it on the client uh, labor care. Uh, what do you call it? the labor progress notes that you have as midwives? The moment she enters into 5 cm, then come and use this WHO labor care guide. Mm -hmm. yes, she can be on it and you monitor. If the contractions are so, as we just said, consider the fetal condition and consider the maternal condition. Mm -hmm. So we are no longer using the service that it should dilate per hour again because the consistency of the service differs. Remember when you are doing vaginal exam, there's some people, they are service. The moment your hand go to it, it's like a flame. It's just tearing apart. Mm. Uh -huh. So we look at that one and monitor our client. And it can be used at any health facility. What that chief's company, even if you want to do domiciliary care for a mother, you can use it. And so that's what have... we are advocating. And it's good. Thank people you. are Hello. Hello. People are testifying about it, so we should all try and see. If can be. Madam, please, I have a question. Uh -huh. Yes. The um, dilatation of the service, like we are the health centers. As the is saying that now it, it's 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 not like one cm per hour, and the woman yes. can be in five cm for about six hours. So, which yes. time are you supposed to um, refer? Maybe the fetal. Um, Condition and the maternal condition is okay, though. And the woman has been in one particular limitation for a longer period, and the woman is even becoming exhausted. Can you refer? Hello, please. That is why the second pass is supportive care. Don't allow this woman to be in stress. Give water. You know, as she's laboring, she's sweating, she's losing for dehydration. So give water, give oral thing, it can be fluid. And the flu can be cocoa, can, can be malt, can be any fluid because you don't know the outcome of labor. So as you are hydrating this person, there wouldn't be any maternal exhaustion. But again, before you can even refer the client, consider the fetal heart, consider the progress of labor, consider the maternal condition. These three are important. So if we are relieving the pain, you know, pain one is severe. The person can even get maternal distress. But then our touch, our comments, our uh, uh, Massages, the non pharmacological method that we have learned in regenerative work. When we apply them, the client will experience positive childbirth. Oh, now I'm in a good hand. And that mentality, psych, can help her to even deliver. We should be with the client all the time. That will help.
that confident in other, oh, now my midwife is winning, unlike the one that I met the last time. All these are psychological things that we are helping them to relieve the pain. Although the pain is there, but it can be lessened and she can deliver per vagina. In one way or the other, if one out of 10 is not improving, don't delay, refer. So we look at so many factors before a referral can be done. And our duty is important here, where we need to discuss with the client, share decision making, what is wrong with you? You have done your assessment. If she is in pain, what can you do about it? One will sit back and they are in pain and they are shouting, they can get maternal exhaustion. But then when they are in pain, we are touching them, we are giving them massage, we are giving them fluid, they will relax. And once you are relaxed, the contraction comes. We say mobile position, allow her to squat, allow her to lie down, or any position of her choice, as we knew. But then if the membranes have ruptured, then she needs to be stable. But explaining to her, that at this time, your membranes have ruptured, so you cannot move about as we are talking about. So just lie on your left lateral to aid the descent of the fetal head. You know, bowel elimination tree is also important. If the bladder is full, this thing cannot occur. Cannot, okay, so we need to look at all this. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. Thank you very, very much for your updates and all that you have given out. However, we are still holding on to the uh, pathograph because like you rightly said, it's not all the facilities that are using the WHO labor care guide. And so once it's not reached wherever they are, they can still use the old pathograph until maybe at the right time, they would receive the disseminated information. But the idea exactly. that that has come, that is why we are still talking about this and then We'll go into that one. Maybe uh, I'm not sure that NMC uh, is using this new labor care guide to examine students. Uh -huh. But like we said in the uh, maternity, uh, uh, the nursing, the, the midwifery, this thing, the family center maternity care that they give. They use they still use the photograph that we we the old one that is being plotted. And so maybe with time, it may even though if the students do have the idea about it, it's good. But then still we'll still talk about the old photograph to help us uh, take the our clients on to monitor and then do all. I hope that. With this new one, we know it has it tells a lot. If we will be diligent in using it in caring for our clients, I think it will help us and then also help the mothers themselves to reach far. We can deliver them spontaneously or if labor has to be ended, it will uh, take through the care that we have given and successfully terminate labor for the woman to get the baby, the family will be happy with the outcome of the labor. And so that is why we are still talking about the old photograph and we are still using it to help ourselves when we get the new uh, labor care guide at our facilities, we will hold it firm and then use it to monitor our clients. And so with the same concept, we'll be able to transfer to the new labor care guide. So thank you very much for the photograph, which we know already, but I don't know whether it is the job that is uh, so much on us that sometimes we are not able to do the plotting of the pathograph, even with this old one. And so if the new one comes in to replace the old, it means that we have to pay particular attention to this document and use it very, very well for our clients. So do we have any question or any other? Sister, please, I have a question. A question? Yes, please. All right. Sister Please, um, part of if a woman comes in labor, the woman comes in, um, 
second stage, maybe the woman comes 9 cm, less than 30 minutes, she has delivered. Mm -hmm. Are you to plot the pathograph? No, you don't put her on a pathograph. Uh, pathograph, sorry. 9 cm, you can't. But with 8 cm, you can put the woman on a pathograph because somebody may be 8 but may spend more than 2 hours in the labor room. And so... Okay, so if, even some people ate, some cases that have my, 8 cm, less than um, one hour, the, the woman has delivered. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, that means that the woman may have very soft and thin uh, service. Okay. And so with, with very good contractions, she can deliver. 9 cm, she can deliver. Okay. And so it depends on our judgment. It depends on our care. Uh -huh. okay. If uh, it becomes necessary for us to use the photograph for somebody who has come and she's about 8 cm. But 9, no, that one, I wouldn't. And there are some cases where you can't use photograph on them. Yes. Give us a few examples. Some cases, even though they have come in labor, they cannot be used for them. We can use, we, uh, for example, eclampsia. She is fitting and is in labor. Sister, APH. APH, sure. APH, you can't use the photograph of APH when she has come in labor. Uh -huh. And so some of these things, they are contraindications to photograph. Apart from these, all other cases, yes, photograph can be used. And so like the new labor care guide, all women who come in labor, labor can be used. In fact, if it's APH and it's identified that it is uh, abrosio, if it's abrosio, what type? First, uh, type one or type two, three and four, you have to. Some women may come and she has the, the type of the previous. The, yeah, the previous, that is it. And even the abruptions, they have the concealed type and then the reveal type. So with the concealed type, the woman is not bleeding. But with the reveal, she is bleeding together with it. Uh -huh. And so the serious aspect is the one who is not bleeding, and she may, she may be bleeding inside the uterus, and so she may get the fibula uterus. After delivery, a very huge uh, clot, very large one. And when this one comes, prepare for uh, uh, PPH management, prepare and resuscitate this woman, because afterwards, she may... Uh, uh, go into shock. Mm -hmm. And so these are some of the things we consider when we are placing the woman. Please, please, can we use Hello. photograph in a precipitate labor? Precipitate? How precipitate? Yes, sister. Was. If, for example, labor. Uh -huh, she has come in labor and then you did your vaginal examination, it was 5 cm. By the time you remove your fingers and then you are writing down your uh, notes to even place on the pathograph. She is complaining that the baby is coming. You went there, the head is in vagina. And so you can't use the pathograph. Precipitate labors, they spend less than 30 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes. Cervical and uh, also is fully open. However, if your day is 5 cm, you do your everything you place on the pathograph alongside less than less than the four hours that you would do the next uh, cervical dilatation. She complains she wants to bear down, and it's about two hours. She's fully dilated, so you close the pathograph in the two hours, fully dilated, and then you can write precipitate labor under under it. Otherwise, anybody who pays the photograph may feel that you don't know how to plot the photograph. Uh -huh. And so all the things that we do, we need to uh, write down 
all documentations is very, very important for us. So, Minister, please, what about small presentations? Can you please throw light on it on using the pathograph? Small presentations, for example, bridge. Yeah. Yes, bridge, you can plot the pathograph, but you can't uh, assess descent. And so where there is head descent, you along the uh, area, you write bridge presentation. Or in some facilities, they have they have developed their own acronyms they use over there. Quite apart from that, you can monitor the human, the contractions, the fetal heart rate, the lipo, everything. But the descent, no. And some areas are let they write W in a very large W in signifying the buttocks coming. Or you can write bridge in uh, capital letters across the line of the descent. Sister, please, what about a uh, twin gestation? Twin gestation, yes. Depending on the uh, pre pre present pre presenting part of the first twin. In fact, uh, you have to listen to the, fact, uh, the fetal heart rate. Concurrently, so one midwife will hold the fetoscope here, another will hold the fetoscope here, and you'll be listening to it at the same time. Now, if the lie of the first wind is longitudinal and the, is, the presentation is cephalic, you use a red pen. So you use two colors. A red pen for maybe first wind and then the blue pen for second twin. If the second twin is breached, in fact, mostly the uh, scan may be able to identify the positions and the presentation of the twins. Unless maybe if they are triplets, that one is difficult. <laughs> but with twins, I know that you can do it, use the red pen, and then you circle where you had the fetal school, uh, the, sorry, fetal heart rate with a pen or a marker on the abdomen. And then the second one to you indicate it. If the second twin is breached and you had it at the upper part of the fundus, or uh -huh, you also indicate it with another color of pen there. And so you can still, uh, Plot it alongside, like I said, red pen for the first twin, blue pen for the second twin. So when you listen to the uh, uh, heart rate of the first twin, you use your red pen to plot. And then if it is the second twin, use the blue pen to plot so that it will run concurrently on the pathograph documentation. And so, our time is up. We'll end the meetings and then God will meet next. Thank you, Sister Blake. What about the 